Hello, everybody. We're live, and the person behind the camera who, can't, who you can't see at the moment is Brian Gallup from the Gallup uh, School of Guitar Building. Um, thanks for having us in the shop today, Brian. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for uh, inviting me to be a part of this. We're really uh, thrilled to be able to work with you. Well, we're, we're, we're great, and I think uh, Brian's very kindly agreed to give us a shop tour. So without further ado, please take it away, Brian. First of all, I think I'd like to just show you this area. This is the bench area that I've been using for 20, 25 years. Um, even though my shop has progressed and moved, I always set my bench up the same way. Uh, this is a just a, like I feel an ideal size workbench. You know, it doesn't, it's big enough so I can work, but it's not so big it can get cluttered. And of course, these are the toolboxes I've collected throughout the years. Uh, the one right there to the in the center of the screen, that was my father's. He taught me on that one in the tool and die shop. And then I slowly picked the rest up as I went until finally I ended up with this tall one. You know, kind of fun stuff. This is my little uh, gumball machine filled with tuner parts. <laughs> and that's always a, a popular item. But you can see this, the, the bench that I work at, it has my basic tools down below. Basic supplies over here for like, you know, bridge pins and strap buttons and so on and so forth. When I get uh, guitars into they're being repaired, I put the parts in just these bins, which is which I've been using that system for, you know, 30 years also. Mm -hmm. As we move down through, we can see we have video in, in the uh, in the shop now. Of course, that's a yeah. new thing since the COVID. Uh, you know, I have to have all my meetings and stuff on video now. Nobody's showing up at the shop, but I hope that that mm -hmm. changes pretty quick. Mm -hmm. uh, the benches that I have in the shop for uh, just basic builds and stuff. You can mm -hmm. see uh, the um, neck billets down below and some rags. There's always rags around the shop. Now we're always cleaning <laughs> with the COVID situation. Everything's disinfected. Mm -hmm. uh, here's, here's a 1939 to 18 that I'm doing a repair on the bridge. Someone gouged out the entire face of the bridge where uh, top where the bridge is gonna go and I had to patch mm -hmm. it and we're gonna make it look as good as we can, but it's still a good guitar. Mm -hmm. Here's a a build I'm just getting ready to do with Brazilian rosewood. It's going to be a gorgeous instrument. Mm. Oh. And that's, that's what once Tyler and I are getting ready to work on. Of course, you can see that neck in the back with the numbers on it. Mm -hmm. That's a build that I'm doing with Dan Earlywine, the, right. um, the Jerry Garcia project. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have these three big stations. And as we do, lay out our builds for the year we lay out the builds on these stations and and they and that's how we can kind of keep track of everything we have going on in the shop mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. on the inside is the wood that i have for the next oh seven years uh that's up here acclimating in my environment the top wood of course is flat top wood most of that is german and italian spruce i fly to germany and italy pick up my wood myself same with the wood down below that's just really nice Old wood is big enough for cellos, but it's my arch top wood, bags, right. necks, and bits, you know. Mm -hmm. um, more necks that are cut out, getting ready for the um, Martin project. Uh, after I kind of nailed down the tone of uh, my guitars and I was comfortable, now I'm reverse profiling a 1937 D18 first one to not only replicate its look and feel, but its sound and response. Mm -hmm. So these billets are cut out and acclimating for that project. And uh, this is an arch top build that we're just getting ready to get back on. Just a nice piece of uh, hard Michigan, excellently flamed maple, but it's not looking beautiful. It not only looks beautiful, but it's um, the right feel, the right density for what I'm looking for on my arch tops. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in this cabinet, this is uh, all Brazilian rosewood. <laughs> it, um, I've been collecting Brazilian rosewood for um, 30 years, and luckily I kept all my papers and all my receipts, and I was able to get a, a registry through the Department of the Interior, Fish and Wildlife, and all of my Brazilian is legal, mm -hmm. and, and it's just really, really beautiful stuff, too. A lot of figure, a lot of straight grain. You can see it's dated, and categorize mm -hmm. that one right that one right there i did during covid covid you can see, I, wrote that. I can see that on there but no there's fret boards and bridges um same as i move down through here it's more fret boards and bridges i have of course i have some figured mahogany and some good hard michigan maple back even mm -hmm. though i don't get 
request for that very much. Um, I still get a request from time to time. These are the builds we're laying out right now. Um, one Indian Rosewood guitar for a customer, that's kind of uh, different, but these are four builds that we're preparing for. Mm -hmm. That um, these builds will come in right around 45,000. Just great Brazilian Rosewood that I've had for about 35 years. It's figured and good. These are some layouts that we're doing for these guitars that are all drawn up in CAD. These were a little, what we do a lot of times, we end up with a, a drawing for the peg head and we push it, which that's a little busy for me, but we learn something and then we dial it back and it ends up with what's going to be the real build. Mm -hmm. You know, but we, I work on this with, with Tom and Tyler and the CNC mm -hmm. department, you know. Um, also, I have cabinets here that uh, keep vintage guitars in always for reference. Um, in this cabinet, I have a 1934 D18 and a 1943 D28 that I always keep around for tone in case I'm working on my guitars. I'm trying to figure out what it is I want to reference for sound. I pull these guitars back out just to kind of remind me. Mm -hmm. And in this cabinet, I have three fenders that are just excellent examples of vintage instruments. One's a Lake Placid Blue Strat that has always sounded good. Mm -hmm. And then my 50s, 1956 Strat, I keep those around for tonal you know, things that center one's a 58 uh, jazz master. That's a really exceptional guitar. And of course, <laughs> you get, you get to see. Um, Brian, thank you very much for the shop tour. It's fantastic. Um, maybe just before you go, um, you were talking a lot about uh, reproducing vintage instruments. And I, I just wanted to ask you, so the, the Talking about vintage instruments, yeah, accumulating data that is the sound of the instrument now, obviously 70, 70, 90 years from when it was built. Mm -hmm. And so when you reproduce an instrument, you reproduce it to the current data point because that's really the reference that we have, right? Mm -hmm. Right. The, the, the question that I always kind of ask is, um, then how will it sound kind of moving forward? So uh, I, I know it's a weird question and let me just give you the context because there are some guitars and a lot of guitars, they play, they play and they get better and they get better. And, but some tend to peak and just remain at the peak, right? Just some, just continue on. Some peak and then drop off for uh, maybe for structural reasons. Um, you know, somebody's messed in the neck or for whatever reason or even potentially natural reasons. Um, is, do, does your building kind of um, peak into the future? As in, do you have sort of the, the kind of software or the sort of experience? Because you have a highly experienced builder. So I'm sure that some of that goes into the reproduction work. Yeah, it, it absolutely does. And those are all great questions and they intertwine. You know, yeah, and that's sorry. Kind, of the, kind of you know, and and that's kind of the big deal. So we'll digress just a little bit. When I, I've been around vintage guitars my entire life. I was lucky to be playing old Martins and old Gibson when I was fifteen. You know, in 1975, 76, they were everywhere. I bought old Strats in boxes in garage sales for thirty five dollars. You know, and stuff like that. And I've always played instruments that had really excellent response. Both electric and acoustic, a great electric guitar has a great acoustic sound before you mm -hmm. plug it into a tube amp and it does its magic. But, you know, um, when you're talking about acoustic instruments, when I sat out to figure out what my tone was, I was really making a guitar to please me. And uh, luckily I had some experience to draw on and I'm a player also. I'm not only a luthier, but I've, I've gigged in bands, you know, for 20 years. And I zoned in on this one sound. Oh, that's why I uh, went into materials big time and, uh, and developed my rating you know, process because materials, materials, materials are everything. And once I finalized my sound and I hit my stride, which I did about eight, nine years ago, let's say, I had created what's known as a profile for that instrument. 
And then when I went into other models, okay, by the way, I just focused on my G2 first. I didn't bounce all over the place, just my G2 model in a cutaway. And then I went on to my G3 and my G6. So I have a nice rounded uh, you know, offering of guitars, three different body sizes, three different voices. But once I finished that, I realized that reverse engineering a guitar was within my grasp because I had enough materials uh, loaded into that system data that I could say, you know, it is with high probability that in order for it to get here after 80 years, it had to start out here. And another thing that is highly probable, you could say almost with absolute, is that if 100 guitars of one model was made in 1937, let's say, mm -hmm. you know, X amount of them just failed. They didn't make the grade because the materials weren't there. And, let, and let's just kind of throw out the ones that were smashed because of accidents or fire or flood or whatever, but still we're ended up with these core excellent examples and they are core excellent examples for one reason, and that's materials. They could withstand uh, being uh, not kept in, in great uh, humidity conditions like we're so hip to today. They just mm -hmm. lived in cases and, and um, houses with forced air heat or fireplaces, all kinds of crazy stuff. So materials is the key. And when I look at an uh, instrument like a 1937 uh, D18 today, which is what I'm focusing on, it's a, a great example to build, to try to reproduce, is that I think it's settled in. Uh, something that's happened over time, and it happens with wood, it goes through something called capillary collapse. In other words, the wood starts out one way and over time it just case hardens. But its density doesn't change. And the general makeup of the guitars built during that range by Martin was pretty tight. So we're really only talking about materials. So I think it gets to a certain point and then it kind of stops. Mm. Uh, and I think that those old vintage guitars reached that point a long time ago. So I, I you know, it's like there's an exponential curve of, of it mm. maturing, 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 and then it flattens off. Mm. And it's like, it's been like that for 50 years. So today, um, I don't think that uh, using my software and rating my wood, I think I'm going to pretty much hit it right off the bat. I think that there's a certain dryness that may uh, develop over, you know, a year or five years, but I think they're going to settle in pretty quick. And only time will tell, but I think it's going to stay like that for a long time. Um, another thing that we have to pay attention to is um, I am building to specs because I want to do a correct reproduction, you know, holding true to what the builders did during that time. Uh -huh. And um, so I'm not changing thicknesses and stuff to, to develop a sound right now. Uh, and, and because I do think it would fail. I do think that the instrument could quack out in five or seven years. What I'm looking for is longevity, uh -huh. you know? So at the correct specs, at the correct thicknesses, I'm choosing different moduluses, different hardnesses and densities to make that happen right now. And why is that? I'm just gonna throw it out really quick, is that people want a guitar that sounds good today. They generally don't want to <laughs> wait a lifetime for it to mature. You know, they want to pick it up and they want it to happen right now. And a lot of those old instrument instruments, you know, people not only can't afford, but if they do have one, they don't want to take it out on the road. So what this guitar is going to do, it's mm -hmm. gonna be the vintage instrument that you can't afford or the one you can't afford to replace, you just don't mm -hmm. want to take it out on the road. And that's what this instrument's going to do. Right, cool. Well, that's that's fantastic. Thank you so much for showing us the shop and cooing us in on your reproduction builds, Brian. I think it's uh, time is getting on. So maybe we'll leave it at that today and we'll catch up uh, real soon. All right, Amy. thanks for, it was Thank really you. a pleasure spending time with you. Oh no, likewise. Thank you, pleasure's all mine. Thank you, take care now.